about how can we learn from people, economically poor people, but very rich in mind. My book on grassroots innovations, I have given a subtitle called as Mind on the Margin are not marginal minds. And the story of these minds, which are not marginal, are extremely insightful because they tell us how can problem be solved with very limited resources, physical resources, material resources, but a lot of imagination. So one of the things that will trigger corporations to move on this path that we are trying to chart out now today is to look at the ratio of the private goods they produce and consume, common goods they produce and consume, and public goods they produce and consume. So as you know, today, 99% of the goods that private sector will make are private goods for private consumption. But they have a lot of knowledge, a lot of ideas, which can be useful for small-scale industry, which can be useful for scholars and scientists, which can be useful for teachers, which can be put in public domain, and they don't. So one of the first lessons that we have to learn is, can we change this ratio? And this is true for all of us sitting here. If I ask you in the last one week, how much of knowledge that you have created was put for private use, common good, and public good, you will get the answer. So we need to change this. And how have societies dealt with this issue? So one of the things that we studied, for example, how does nature bring in, is brought into the urban space? So we did a study of bird feeding platforms. How do you feed birds? They need to have grains. And we found that regions which had less productivity, which were drought-prone region, dry region, had more bird feeding platforms than the prosperous region. So the lesson is, those who have less, share more. Those who have less, share more. And not just with humans, but also with non-human beings. How do we make connections across boundaries? We need to unlearn the inertia, we need to redesign pedagogies, celebrate grassroots creativity, and internalize frugal future. And that sometimes is not so easy, because there's so much inertia deeply stemmed in our life. So one of the tragedy, one of the dilemma, one of the paradoxes that we've all lived with is that we know so much. We feel about this much. And we actually take actions only this much. Is that it true? So a lot of feelings which are our own. They're not somebody else's feeling. Feelings that are produced in my heart, I'm not acting on them. So how do we change this ratio? And that requires a spontaneity, that requires respect for agency. So a lot of us have autonomy, but we lack agency, the ability to use that autonomy. We have freedom, but we, don't, we, lack, we lack initiatives and innovations to use that. Freedom. So what are we trying to say? We are trying to say, see the unseen, hear the unheard, and speak the unspoken. Today, that is not very easy, because it, it involves risks, professional risks, individual risks, but that is the need of the hour. If we want our societies to be inclusive, we will have to bring this in. So what are the crises that we are facing? There are four indicators which I can see as indicators of crisis in urban areas, in our societies, but also in the country. First is that consumption-based society is not creating enough choices. We all seem to know what we are going to do. There's a trend, and the trend becomes the pattern of the entire society. Very quickly, very soon. Our download to upload ratio is very high. So if each one of you looks at how much content did you download last week, and how much did you upload? You will get the lesson, answer. The problem is that we are consumer of knowledge and, society and ideas, but our ideas we are not sharing. How can societies grow and be more collaborative, more compassionate, more creative, if we don't change this ratio? So this is one ratio that we need to evaluate. The virtual connections taken over the proximal connections. I have less connection to my next door neighbor than to somebody thousands of miles away. And fourth is that caring and sharing spaces have constricted. So there, there's hardly any space in the city of Paris, for example, where you can go and leave your canvas for people to look at. 
without your being present. Or I can leave a sculpture. Or I can leave some clay where people can come and jointly design a, a structure out of that clay. Or an installation that I can leave on a roadside for anybody to observe. I don't have to go to gallery to consume art and culture. It should happen on the roadside. It happens. It should happen in everyday conversation. What are the signs of hope? The signs of hope are grassroots creativity is kicking and alive. Because they don't have access to institutions, they don't have a lot of resources to use market-based choices. What do they do? They will have to solve problems themselves. Frugality and flexibility forge fellowship. When you have to solve problems frugally and to solve them in a flexible manner, it is inevitable that you need to talk to others, to share, to collaborate to learn from others' experiences, because that's the most critical resource at that moment in you, knowledge. And therefore, fellowship increases, solidarity increases. So frugal innovations are useful not just because they are saving our cost and time and resources, they're also useful because they bring us together. That's one of the important lessons that corporations need to learn from grassroots creativity. Multifunctionality, subsidiarity, circularity. You see, I was talking to somebody yesterday that if you look at auto sector, what do you do when a car is about 15 years, you junk it and make it into a sheet of metal. Not in my country. We know that the age of axle is about 45 years. The steering wheel has about 100 years age. Why should I junk it? Why can't I reuse it in some other applications? So a lot of grassroots innovations use second-hand components because there's energy still there to be tapped. When untapped energy is available in any component, it must have second, third, fourth generation of application. And at the time of manufacture, corporations must think of second, third, fourth generation use of those components and make it available, those choices to the users, so that if they want to make those applications themselves, they can do it themselves, or they can pass it on to those who will collect these components and provide it to the innovators who want to develop these solutions. So the days when, I mean, in, in, an organ of my body can get transplanted and live in your body for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, but I don't want my component of a car to be used in your car. Why? What's the problem? If we want circular economy, if we want zero waste in our society, then there is no choice but to use components. Still, the energy in them has been used optimally. Frugality is to make things last long. Fashions change every week or every fortnight or every month. What dress you bought last season is no more interesting for you to wear. But that is not what this frugal consumption is all about. So how do we do that? How do we change the preferences of the consumer so they begin to appreciate durability? They begin to appreciate things that last long. That's what our culture is all about. Which means there's a change required in the way we think about. Cities don't have to become junkyards. or create, They must become creative labs. Our children deserve choice. Our children deserve choice. We should reduce our own choice to be able to expand their choices. So we do these walks in different parts of the country. Three times a year I walk. Summer I go to the places which are hot. Winter we go to the places which are cold. Autumn we go to the mountains, Himalaya, to discover and learn from four teachers. A teacher within, teacher around us, teacher in the nature, and teacher among common people. These four teachers are available to all of us everywhere. You don't have to come to India to learn from these four teachers. Anywhere, everywhere. These teachers are available. And it is useful to draw a balance sheet once in a while to ask ourselves, how much did I learn from common people? How much did I learn from nature? How much did I learn from each other? So let me give you a very interesting example about sharing. You know, France has caves where art has been found, about 40,000-year-old art. Cave, art. cave paintings have been found in France. In our country, also around 30,000, 40,000. Now, 30, 40,000 years ago, there was no civilization. There was no language. There were no communities as we understand today. But there was an urge to share the creative expressions. My argument is that sharing is in our genes. It is something that we are born with. It is something that is natural to us. Because these cave paintings of everywhere in the world, in Indonesia, France, India, and Europe in many places, demonstrate a fundamental urge of human beings 
to show and share and of course communicate messages which we can get even today as clearly as we could do at that time. So shared spaces, shared spaces. If we don't share, we don't care. And how do we do that? How do we create mindfulness and not just mindsets? When I consume creative expressions, it creates mindfulness, market for mindfulness. I can engage long enough. Today in Twitter age, in television channel age, my span of attention has got down to a few seconds. How oh, where is the scope for mindfulness to imagine that? I need a deep engagement, a long conversation, a long walk for the matter. And to produce that, we need to create spaces in urban areas and for that matter everywhere else where people can go for walks and talk and see the things. So we need to realize that when connections are made, randomness plays out, concern for strangers and even perfect strangers manifest, alienation gets malevolent. So if you find more alienation, more suicides, more depression, more schizophrenia, Please understand that we are losing out on connections. And please understand the social connections directly affect my neural connections. The less connections we have, physical life, social life, the less connection between left and right brain I have. So there's a, in my book I have a section on why women have more intuition. And a neurological study by Ragni Verma has shown at University of Pennsylvania that in the brain of women, there are more left to right connections, in the men, more front to back connections. And the reason is that women have had a long held practice. They didn't keep their hands idle even when they were relaxing. They were knitting, they were stitching, they were breaking seats. So even in the hours of reflection, they were doing action. And that created a unique capacity that men lack, which we should learn and acquire from the women who have this ability. So how do we create that reflective and care, ca caring spaces? Children, our grandchildren, how do we create more learning? So today morning I did something very interesting, uh, to me at least. I talked to the children who had been brought here, the students who had been brought here from neighborhood schools. And I asked them, why have you come here? Well, we have come here to get experience of, uh, we share, all right. But I think there's another reason why you are here. You have come here to share your ideas. Ideas. We don't have ideas. No, 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 you have ideas. So Arman began by saying, yes, I have an idea. And I did a Facebook Live, and you can get it on my Facebook page. Six kids with whom I did a Facebook Live interview about their ideas have got now 1,000 views already. And it's going to increase. The first idea that Arman gave was, and I will not go into all ideas, but just to show you how children are not just sync of sermons, they can be source of ideas. A problem that he noticed was that many times when you use cell phone and you are talking on the cell phone, your elbow doesn't have a rest. Sometimes you do like this. And then you are constraining your body. And you're doing like this. And your neck is bending. Sometimes like this. So what did he do? He designed a belt with a pocket. And in this pocket, you can rest your elbow. Your neck doesn't have to bend. You can do like this, with a pocket. I said, what happened to this idea? Nothing, I just left it at that. I said, no, I'm going to invest in your idea, make 50 pieces, do a market research. I'm coming back in November, I want to get the market research report. What am I trying to say? I'm saying, we need to invest in the ideas of the children, who I begin to see and get convinced are much more sensitive to the inertia than we are. Our generation learned to live with problems unsolved indefinitely. Our young children don't want to live with problems unsolved indefinitely. They want solutions here and now. And that's wonderful. That's the best news I can give you. That our children are far more optimistic, far less patient with inertia, unlike our generation. So how do we build upon that? How do we create that culture? So culture of creativity and sharing is very fundamental. So in one of the villages in West Bengal where we were having a walk, we found these beautiful terracotta horses. So we asked the potters, why did you keep such beautiful horses? Somebody can take them, somebody can break them. You have kept them in open. They said, 
professor, by the time they knew I was a professor. Professor, you have done a mistake. I said, what mistake did I do? We haven't kept the most beautiful ones. We have kept the best ones. Why do you keep your best creations on the roadside under a tree? So that when our children go to school in the morning, they will see what the current standard of the best is. They must do better. Oh my God, open source standards of excellence. That's how this community propels the children to do better than what their parents have done. I wish every street of Paris, every long pathway will have some windows, some walls declaring who has the maximum plants in his garden. You want to come and see? Welcome. We have 250 species in my garden. Come and see diversity in city. Or I am going to have a class where I will teach you 200 different ways in which you can use basil leaf to make different kinds of dishes or whatever else. Standards of excellence available to people to learn from, feel jealous about, and really and at the same time feel inspired about. We need, corporations can learn to create standards, open source standards for each industry in which they're operating, so that there's a pressure on everybody to perform, to think, to create better than what has happened before. So landscapes of love, the argument, central argument in this is here that we should have open spaces where people can put self-organizing spaces. I was very happy when the uh, today, for about two hours, the space was provided in WeShare for people to self-organize various learning opportunities from each other. We need more such spaces in the cities. We need, there are very few spaces of this kind, even in the school. There is not one class that children can manage, design, and deliver to themselves. But why not? Every day, there should be one class that children will design and manage and provide the content. Whatever they want to do, let them vote and decide. So self-organizing principle will not take place unless our school education, unless our curriculum provides for that kind of agency to the kids at early age to learn about how they can do that. So shared spaces, not just for human, but also non-human beings from sink to source. And how do we do that? How do we create curiosity as the driver of compassion? So you have heard about IoT. In many cities today, you have parking places where there is a sensor so that it can give you information about which parking space, which lot has how much space. So therefore, I said, well, do we need to really talk about IoT or IoTT? What is IoTT? Internet of things, thoughts, and feelings. So if your pets are stressed, you get a signal, oh, last three days, four days, you have not talked to me, you have not played with me, I'm stressed. If your plants are stressed because you have not given them water or you have not spent time with them, you have been traveling, the message comes, plants are stressed. Or if your grandparents are upset because you have not had even one dialogue with them in for the last two weeks, you have not called them, you have not sat with them, message comes, they are stressed. Talk to them. Internet of things, thoughts, and feelings. We need new ways of thinking about how technology will be used to make creative spaces, collaborative spaces. So Honeybee Network, as you can see here, uh, has nameless, faceless person coming in contact with the network, getting an identity. This is what I do. So six kids whom I interviewed today morning are all around the world are, being fam are famous now. Because people are looking at their ideas, thinking about it. Somebody wants to make material library. Somebody has made a software. In second year, that kid has made a software he showed me in this space, you want to situate sofa here, you want to look in real time, how will it look if you change the sofa here or a plot, pot of plant there? He designed that. Somebody needs to invest in that and take it forward. So Honeybee Network provides space for creativity, innovation, and Srashti, which is a voluntary organization, says, give me a space to stand and I'll move the world. I, that's my faith. That that's what people's knowledge has. This is the book which has come out, available on Amazon.com. And here is a very interesting cover page of our magazine, Honeybee Newsletter, where I've shown the life of innovator. It oscillates between randomness and strategic choice. We need both. We need both. And therefore, we need to find out ways in which we can search innovation, spread innovation, celebrate innovation, and sense the unmet needs. Every corporation must train its executives to do all the four things. 
Every organization must do this, all the four things. Search innovation. Innovation by others, not just your ideas. Spread innovations. Celebrate, bring the innovator to your classroom, to your meeting room, to your hall, to your board meeting. Let them explain how did they solve problems so frugally and sense the unmet needs. What are the needs which have not been met as, as a driver of innovation? So this is a double-decker bridge made of tree roots, a practically no waste in this bridge. Why did they make it? Because the community wanted to make a bridge which is different from everybody else. So first culprit in this story is culture. Culture creates curiosity. Culture makes us ask questions. Culture said, let's do something different, something naturally sustainable, something which will not produce any waste. So how do you do that? So then you search what kind of technology. So you see the roots of rubber trees hanging on the side. Maybe these roots can be stressed as rope. But then I can't make this bridge alone, so you need institutions. So technology is like word, institutions are like grammar, culture is like thesaurus. We need all the three for an ecosystem to be sustainable. That's a lesson that corporations must learn. They want to create a manager post, a, a general manager innovation. And then they expect from next day innovations will happen. But what about the culture of innovation? What about the institutions that are to be created? So context can change the con content. This is the summary of what I have been trying to say, that let us change the context in which we look at our urban life, which is in which we look at corporate life, and see how this context can be changed to bring in different kinds of doing more from less. So this is an example, a walker. In Europe, in France, you have a walker. But if you want to use that walker on a step, it doesn't have adjustable legs. This girl in class eight sent us an idea. Can you make it? We made it. License to an entrepreneur. She became the youngest entrepreneur who got license money and royalty on the sale of every walker. A child found the unmet need of our society. A universal product. It is useful in France, it is useful in USA, it is useful in India. You need adjustable leg walker. When you go up, legs become shorter. When you come down, they become taller. Like that, there are a lot of innovations. Many of you are not sitting properly. The friend here, his band, back is bending. I can't help it. You will have little pain in your back. Unfortunately, I can't help it. So what do children say? If you're sitting like this, the four senses on your back will not be getting pressed. Chair will start singing music and will not let you work. Or the screen will go blank and a message will come, sit properly or I will not let you do work. So let me just close very quickly. These are the ideas of class five, class six, class seven kids. No big company has thought about this. What are we talking about therefore? Corporations must learn to learn from children, from learning, I mean, from the young kids. Look at this simple idea, a one hand pump in a school, six kids now can drink simultaneously, otherwise they have to stand in a queue. And if there are 40, 50 kids, they will take so much time to get water. Simple idea, doesn't cost more than 10 euros. A lot of these innovations, this is the triangle that we need to make it happen. Innovation investment enterprise are not at one place, one hand, one Person, so we need to find ways of linking them up, reducing transaction cost of them. And every corporation can also be an incubator. If you are an auto manufacturing company, provide a space for auto-based innovations to be nurtured there. Today we have all the incubators in the educational institutions. There are very few incubators in the companies, in the factories, in the manufacturing places. Amazing, nowhere in the world. But that's where the manufacturing takes place. They know what the problems of scaling up are. Let them be involved at the stage of mentoring the young kids very early. That's something that you can do. Frugal innovations are not just product and process, but also supply chain. You should make it accessible, you should make it affordable, you should make it available. So supply chain should also be frugal, otherwise it will not work. Scale should not be allowed to become enemy of sustainability. Corporations must learn that there are niche-specific problems. If a problem affects 10,000 people, don't tell me that make it a million people must be affected by this problem, otherwise I will not manufacture a solution because I want to sell minimum of million pieces. What is this? You want a problem to be scaled up? Only then you will manufacture? That's very wrong. So how do we make, when systems are predictable, stable, uniform, you need to look outside. I will not have discussed this. You can find it on the slide share. Open innovation. Learn from outside, share with outside. This is a portal on, uh, which has 190,000 engineering projects at techpedia.in. Corporations must make this possible for small-scale industry to learn from these student projects so that the jobs are generated by small sector. That has to become more dynamic, has to become more creative. 
So let me close by saying that these are the four institutions which came about 30 years ago, Honeybee Network, then Srishti, Gyan, and National Innovation Foundation. Creativity counts, knowledge matters, innovations transform, but incentives inspire not just material incentive, but also non-material incentive, not just individual incentive, but also collective incentive. Thank you so much.